Okay, we're back. We're live. We're here on uh, Community Matters with Rabbi Mitchell Krasnjanski. He comes to visit with us every couple of weeks, and we really enjoy learning from the rabbi. Welcome Same to here. the show, Rabbi. Thank you, Jay. Always a pleasure being here. <laughs> so you're having, a, you're having an event on the 18th, and that's 18th of July this week. Correct. Can you talk about it? Sure. Uh, as you know, we had uh, two Torah scrolls that were stolen from uh, the synagogue, from Chabad, a little over a year ago, about a year and a half ago, December of 2018. 17, sorry, December 2017. But the 18th is a lucky number. <laughs> it, it is. life. It is life, yeah. yes. And uh, a couple of months ago, we had two new Torahs that were dedicated to synagogue, and we did a big Torah celebration. And this Thursday, we're having another Torah dedication. Someone else came forward and had a Torah written in Israel, and it just came actually today. We're going to have a big celebration uh, this Thursday. In fact, this Torah is different, and that is it's being written for all the children, all the Jewish children under the age of bar and bat mitzvah, under 12 and 13 years old. Because usually when you write a Torah, people participate by sponsoring a letter of the Torah. But this one is only for the children. And many, many years ago, the Rebbe, Rabbi Schneerson, talked about, we know that the Torah uh, represents unity. The Torah unites us as a people. So the Rebbe came out with this project to write a Torah, and everyone should participate in the writing by sponsoring a letter, and also to have special Torahs written just for children. The Rebbe was a big, big, big advocate of um, invest. The Rebbe invested many, 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 many hours and thought and teachings to the children, the future generation, the future, our future. It's all about education, isn't yes. it? As a matter of fact, Chabad has um, lobbied for and, and sponsors uh, Education Day Correct. in Hawaii and maybe nationally as right. well? In, nationally and internationally, yes. Yeah, that's really important. Yes. So that's uh, you know, synonymous with the whole mission uh, and certainly with um, the Torah for the children. Right, right. So that's this Thursday, and everyone who's listening Please come and join us. It's at 5.30 p.m. There's going to be a lot of music and dancing, great festivities for the whole family. I remember, uh, it must be 60, 90 days ago, yeah. I, I visited you on Atkinson uh, at the, the Chabad temple there. And um, you had two Torahs that you had achieved after the, the theft a year ago. Um, and there was... A, there was Klezmer music playing. Was it Klezmer? It was, it was very catchy music. It yes. was dance music. Yes. Um, Jewish dance music. Jewish dance music. <laughs> and it was on Atkinson Drive. And there were hundreds of people there. And there was a, a chuppah. Yes. Uh, and you had people, I mean, especially anointed people, because not everybody can or should do this, dancing with the Torahs. And they were having such a good time. And I said to myself, gee, I would have to be 50 years younger if I was uh -huh. going to dance for this long uh -huh. with this kind of vitality because those, those guys holding the Torahs, they were dancing up a storm. They were, they, I couldn't do that anymore. <laughs> Never know until you try. <laughs> yeah, I was there with Josh Green, yeah. Lieutenant Governor, and uh, we were... And hopefully we, you'll be able to come again this Thursday. Maybe bring your crew and... Oh, another, that'll be good. Yeah. That'll be good. Very important. Okay. It's a statement. But tell me, what is the statement? The statement is you have been able to uh, obtain uh, another Torah right. uh, for the children this time. It takes a long time to write one. You write one by hand. You have to have a special scribe, scribe to write it yeah. by hand. It and takes it's, about it's a year, so close to, to a year, to write a, a Torah. Yeah, it's a big undertaking. Well, the statement in general is that, uh, you know, it was tragic when the Torahs were stolen. And our task and the Rebbe pointed out many different occasions, and it's in line with the basic teachings of the mystical teachings of Judaism, is to turn uh, something negative into something positive, to turn things around. So it's not enough just to replace the stolen Torahs. If two were stolen, then we're going to replace them with four or five new ones. <laughs> There's a statement. Yeah, that's a statement. <laughs> and there was... Um, 
many, many years ago, before it was so commonplace, in Israel, uh, some Arab Palestinians, Palestinian terrorists, uh, broke into a Jewish Chabad school while the students were praying and began to indiscriminately shoot at the students, and five students were killed. These are young kids. These were young kids, maybe 13, 14 year old kids. And this happened in the, in the um, I believe, in the early 60s. 1960s. And uh, the Rebbe came out and said that the only appropriate response to this tragedy was to build five new institutions, five new schools corresponding to the five kids that were, that were killed. And, uh, you know, because with increased darkness, you got to increase the light, so to speak. And that's been the Rebbe's general teaching and approach to things of this nature, of this extreme nature, but in general, turn, turn everything into something positive. So that's Where in Israel did that take place? That took place in Kfar Chabad. Kfar Chabad is a village right, right, right next to the Ben-Gurion airport, not far from Tel Aviv. It was a, a village that was founded in the... 19, early 1950s from the Russian emigres, because uh, many of the Chabad Hasidim were uh, Russian and they came from Russia. They emigrated to Israel from Russia and they uh, established um, a little town. Today it's not little, today it's very large, very big, and that's where it happened. You know, um, every little town, every city in Israel has a history like that. Yeah. With some kind of needless attack, with murderous intention and result. Um, I know somebody who uh, is at a kibbutz. Uh, I can't remember the exact name, but the David was in the name. It was in the northeast corner of Israel. And, um, and they're, they're underground. The kibbutz is underground. Oh, wow. Because they've had so many attacks. Mm. So um, <clears throat> what we have here is, uh, is the memory of this sort of thing. And you... you you demonstrate exactly what the Jewish reaction is when something like that takes place, or when they come around and steal your Torah. Torahs. So, so uh, one of the things that we're going to talk about today is uh, two things. Uh, in Chabad, we mark two days. One today, which in the Hebrew month is the 13th day of the month of Tammuz. And Can you spell Tammuz? T-A-M-M-U-Z. Usually falls out around July or August. Mm -hmm. And today, in 1927, the previous Chabad Rebbe, his name was Rabbi Yosef Yitzhak Schneerson, who lived in Russia, was born and raised and grew up in Russia. Um, at some point, he, this was during the height of the communist reign, and he was arrested for his tireless work on behalf of keeping the torch of Judaism alive in Russia. Because the communists forbade any kind of religious practice, and um, it was uh, illegal and by punishment of death or imprisonment to, uh, to observe anything Jewish. However, the Rebbe, the previous Rebbe, uh, he had a whole network of schools and synagogues that were pretty much underground where, um, where all of the activities just kept, were, were kept up, but they were kept up in hiding. And um, it, it embraced the whole length and breadth of Russia. It was a big, big, big undertaking. And at some point they arrested the previous Rebbe. And um, and in those days when you were arrested, it, uh, it, w it wasn't like prison today where you have rights and you have due uh, process, due and, process and representation. <clears throat> this is, uh, you know, they, they were a thoroughly um, evil, and corrupt government regime. They killed people like flies all the time. And there was a great, 
danger for the Rebbe's life. And uh, there's a, fascin it's a fascinating story. The end of the story is a very good story in that he was released. Um, but, you know, the behind the story, the behind the scene was an amazing story of, of, of uh, firstly, unbelievable courage on the part of the previous Rebbe uh, in, in handling this whole, uh, this whole affair. His name was what? Yitzhak? Joseph Isaac Schneerson. Joseph Isaac Schneerson. Schneerson. The name Schneerson. And he was a Talmudic scholar to begin. He yeah. was a brilliant Talmudic scholar as well as a And teacher. here's a picture of him. Yes. Yeah. Uh, see, Rabbi Joseph Isaac Schneerson, mm -hmm. the sixth Chabad Rebbe, who lived most of his life in Russia. What part of Russia? Well, well Chabad was, uh, Chabad is... Um, the name of the philosophy, because this movement has a very distinct philosophy. Chabad in Hebrew uh, me is an abbreviation for the words Chokhmah, Bina, and Das, wisdom, understanding, and knowledge. Chokhmah, Chokhmah Bina, Bina, and das, das, which is translated as wisdom, understanding, and knowledge, which represent the intellectual faculties, because this Hasidic movement placed a great emphasis on the intellectual uh, the need to intellectually comprehend uh, and understand uh, and not just accept things on faith, things of that nature. And a chokhm is a smart person, a wise person. A wise right? person, a exactly. Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> so Chabad is the name of the, um, the organization is known by Chabad, or the movement is known as Chabad, but Chabad is really the name of the philosophy. The, 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 the town in which Many of the leaders lived, going back 200 years or more, was called Lubavitch. That's why it's Chabad Lubavitch. Uh, Lubavitch is a small little town in, 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 I think it's in Belarus, White Russia. They're still there? Still there. Small little town. I, I doubt there are a lot of Jews there, though. There's not. Well, actually, they resurrected the town and they rebuilt the uh, synagogue there. People went back after people the People went back. Well, no, people go to visit. And, and to visit the grave sites of the holy men there. And stuff like a lot that. of people killed there during the war. A lot of people killed there. So the previous Rebbe was sitting in jail, and, and there was a real danger that they would kill him, like they have done countless times before. Uh, but with a great miracle, he was released from prison, and in, in no small part because, fascinating story, because... Um, uh, pressure was brought to bear on the communist government to release him by, uh, 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 I think it was Roosevelt, by the President of the United States. There was a, um, maybe you would know, uh, Morgenthau, he was the... Yeah, he, Robert Morgenthau. Yeah, yeah he, he was, uh, what was he, he was the... Um, what position did he have? He was a. Uh, I don't know what office he held, yeah. but he was in uh, FDR's cabinet. cabinet yeah. yeah, he was in the cabinet, and he was Jewish. Yeah. And then there was the Chief Justice Leo Brandeis. Jewish. Jewish. And they all were uh, were were brought in, and they put tremendous amount of pressure, and to, to Roosevelt. The, the Russian government, the communist government, freed the previous Rebbe. Um, he, he was expelled, and but in, they freed him by expelling him from Russia. Oh, yes. so they expelled him at that expelled time. Expelled him from Russia. He, from, from there, he went to he went to uh, war to Poland, Warsaw, and um, he was there for many years, and he. Finally, got out of of Poland uh, after the Nazis took over. The Nazis came to power. Lucky to get out. He was lucky to get out again with the with the aid of the United States government. And and it's a fascinating story how um, a member of the SS uh, was put up, was put to the task of finding the. Rabbi Schneerson in Warsaw and getting him out of, of Warsaw. And at first, the, uh, the, the, the Rebbe, the previous Rebbe, 
because he was in hiding at the time because the, the, the Nazis were hunting down for the Jewish leaders and killing them. He was in hiding, and um, and until he, he was he was notified by his followers in America that this big effort is being undertaken to get him out, and that such and such person would contact him, and that such and such person was an SS man. And the reason why the SS did that was to, I guess, curry some favor with the United States. Um, I think this was before the U.S. joined the... Well, he had know. friends all the way through in high places in he, the United yeah, States. Yeah, he was, he was like the him. world leader of the, the Jewish well, leader. He had a lot of followers. He had a lot of followers. And I guess the followers were not only, um, you know, in Russia... And the, in Poland, right, but also in right America, here in yeah, the United States. Exactly. Yeah. He was, and he was, uh, he, was uh, he was the founder of the Chabad movement? No, the found, he was the sixth generation. It had of, existed before. It existed in, in um, it started in the early 1700s, uh, or in the late 1700s. And this Rebbe who we're talking about, who was freed from prison, was the sixth in the dynasty. And then when he passed away in 1950, his son-in-law, Rabbi Menachem Schneerson, uh, who was the seventh Chabad Rebbe, he was the Rebbe of our generation, and he was the one who, who took a small group of followers. Because at the time after, after the Holocaust, so many Jews got wiped out that, uh, you know, it was just embers left from what was, and he rebuilt it into the worldwide Chabad movement that which, is today. Which we have today. Which we have today. Yeah. Let's take a short break, Rabbi. We'll come back and talk more about the Rebbe, Rebbe Menachem Schneerson, and uh, his life and what he did for uh, Chabad and the Lubavitcher movement, and, and how that impacts us today. We'll be right back. Hi, I'm Rusty Komori, host of Beyond the Lines. I was the head coach for the Punahou Boys varsity tennis team for 22 years, and we we're fortunate to win 22 consecutive state championships. This show is based on my book, which is also titled Beyond the Lines, and it's about leadership, creating a superior culture of excellence, achieving and sustaining success, and finding greatness. If you're a student, parent, sports or business person, and want to improve your life, and the lives of people around you. Tune in and join me on Mondays at 11 a.m. as we go beyond the lines on Think Tech Hawaii. Aloha. Aloha, I'm your host, Sharon Thomas Yarbrough of Sister Power here at Think Tech of IE. And Sister Power is all about motivating, empowering, educating, and inspiring all people. And we have various subjects here. Sister Power is here at ThinkTech every other Thursday at 4 p.m. Again, my name is Sharon Thomas Yarbrough, host of Sister Power. We look forward to seeing you. If you have any questions, feel free to contact me at sistersempoweringhawaii at gmail.com. Look forward to chatting with you soon. Aloha. We're here with uh, Rabbi Itchel Krasnjanski. Uh, he's the rabbi of Chabad of Hawaii. And we're having a very in interesting discussion about Chabad dating back to the 17th century and all the rabbis that have been involved uh, in Lubavitcher uh, and across the world. So we talked about uh, Rabbi um, Yosef, Yitzhak, yes. Yitzhak, Yosef Yitzhak, uh, who died in 1950 after an interesting and troubled experience with both the Russians and the Germans. Uh, thanks to the support of the American government, he was able to get to safety uh, on both occasions. Yes. Uh, and, um, and now uh, he left behind him his son-in-law, Rabbi Menachem, Menachem uh, Schneerson. Uh, and uh, that's 1950. And see, that's, that's modern times as far as I'm concerned, Rabbi. Yes. So how did, that, how did that work? How did, how did uh, Menachem uh, get into the uh, leadership position? Okay. Um, well, that's a very interesting question. The Rebbe um, assumed the leadership, uh, Rabbi Menachem Schneerson assumed the leadership in 1951 
one year to the anniversary of the passing of his father-in-law. And he served in that capacity as the leader of That's Chabad. a symbolic period, one year. It's a yeah. mourning period. Yes. Yeah. yes. Yeah. And he served as Rebbe uh, until 1992. Passed away in 41 years. And uh, it was a remarkable, remarkable period when the Rebbe um, energized um, the small uh, Hasidic group of Jews, and uh, through them, the wider Jewish community. Uh, you have to understand that uh, 1950 was just barely 10 years or less after World War II, after the horror of the Holocaust, when the survivors, many of them who've come to America or to different parts of the world, were all shattered and broken. Demoralized. And demoralized. Yeah. And the Rebbe um, uh, began, you know, with a message, a very positive message, a very uh, rejuvenating message about the, uh, the good, the goodness inherent in this world, latently in this world and life, and, in, and through the teachings of the Torah and the mystical teachings of the Torah. The but Rebbe, they needed to hear that. They needed to hear that. And it, it, it drew uh, many, many, many people to the Rebbe, and the Rebbe started this outreach effort, send out young, young rabbis to different communities across the United States and across the world. And today, uh, there are several thousand Chabad centers around the world, all teaching the message of the Rebbe, you know, to be inclusive and, and welcoming and loving, and, and how, you know, and, and the relevance and the positive message of the Torah. A Chabad center is a congregation. Yes, but it's a, it's a, it's more of a. They're called Chabad houses because it's more of a house feeling than a formal... People spend a lot of time there. They yeah. gather there. It's they a social gather. experience as yeah. well as a religious experience. Exactly. And it's all a very loving, non-judgmental, welcoming experience. And that's what... Um, Don't forget the eating part. The eating part is the most important part. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, okay, and uh, when were you ordained, by the way, in all of this? I was, uh, I was born in 1960. And I was ordained as a rabbi uh, in 1985. Did you come to Hawaii right away, or were you? And I came to Hawaii in 1987. Huh. It, it seems like a long time ago, but it's not that long ago. I'm yeah. sorry. <laughs> <laughs> right. So um, you know, this is—it's really interesting. So there's a there's a combination ceremony we're having here. Right. Um, on the birthday of the Rabbi Yitzchak Schneerson and Rabbi Menachem Schneerson right. and is, is happening this week. Both, both of them are being celebrated. No? Right, so the, the, the birthday and the celebration of the release from prison uh, of, of the previous Chabad Rabbi, Rabbi Yosef Yitzchak Isaac Schneerson, that is today in the Hebrew calendar, and the commemoration of the Rabbi's passing was uh, this past week. And, uh, you know, uh, many, many Jewish people around the world, um, you can, you, I don't know if celebration is the right word when you commemorate the past. Yeah. yeah, but it's, it's, it's not a sad, it's not a sad commemoration. It's a commemoration that, uh, you know, that, uh, that highlights and celebrates the teachings of the Rebbe. Mm -hmm. Which are, uh, you know, which are as relevant today and as needed. The world needs to, needs it today as when it was spoken, twenty, thirty, forty years ago. Well, that that actually brings me to an interesting question, which I have thought about. You know, whenever we've met, um, you've um, indicated with a great affection and respect. Um, you know how much of a contribution, um, Menachem, Rabbi Menachem, Rabbi yeah. Rabbi Menachem. Nerson has put into the uh, Lubavitcher community, and indeed, um, he, is, he is permeated through that community. Um, but you also said that just now that there have been seven rabbis uh, Correct. since this, what, 17th century or right. 1700s? Right. Um, in the Lubavitcher community, in the Chabad 
organizations, so the Chabad movement, uh, Chabad philosophy. Um, so what happens after Rebbe Menachem dies? Uh, isn't there an eighth and a ninth? I mean, don't we have a succession plan here? Um, and uh, you think it could be you? <laughs> well, I, first of all, I can tell you the, easy, the, the easiest answer as the first answer. In reference to me, the answer is absolutely not. I, I had to ask. Okay, thank you. Uh, that's a very interesting question. When the Rebbe passed away, because the Rebbe had no children. The Rebbe and his wife could not have children. When the Rebbe passed away in 1992, there were many, many, you know, experts who were, who were uh, saying that now the movement is going to wane and going to fade away because it no longer has a leader. Um, but in the last 25 years, what we saw is the very opposite. Not only has it grown, but it's grown exponentially. When the Rebbe passed away in 1992, there were maybe 1,000 Chabad centers around the world. Today, there are over 5,000. These are all, and that's the amazing thing. Young people who actually never met the Rebbe in person, uh, but are uh, studying the Rebbe's teachings and are, are enthused and, and inspired by the Rebbe's message and teachings, and they themselves have gone out and become Chabad rabbis and pass that message on. It's a message that um, there's a lot of aspects to it, but the, at the core is the faith uh, of God, of the Torah, in each and every one of us. Every single human being has an important role to play in this world, a contribution to make. It's bigger than all of us bigger than all of us, but it, it, it needs all of us. It needs all of it us. It needs all of us, or each and every one of us, to make the, our unique contribution that only we could make. But, but after a time, don't you think that uh, the Rabbi Menachem, Rebbe Menachem uh, Schneerson's message will, will fade simply by the passage of time? Uh, you know, I give you 10 years, 20 years, 50 years ahead. Um, don't we need to have another uh, a Lubavitcher uh, Rebbe who will carry the torch, who will reinvigorate things as we go forward? So, um, you would think so, but no. I'll tell you why. <laughs> okay. So, for example, we know that the temple, the Jewish temple, was destroyed close to 2,000 years ago. because It was burnt down by the Romans. And uh, question is, why can't we rebuild another temple, right? Especially, That's a good question. Right? Many synagogues are burnt to the ground and are rebuilt, you know, a year or two later. Happens, happens. Why, why was a temple never rebuilt? And the answer is, synagogue is a small little holy place, but the temple represented uh, God's, you know, manifestation here on earth. And because it's such a large, larger than life uh, edifice, so uh, we are taught in the Torah that when the Messiah comes, he will rebuild the third temple. So in answer to your question, uh, you know, rabbis come and go, teachers come and go. Uh, when one person, you know, passes on, someone else steps in and moves things along. But when you have one rabbi but who when you is have a so rabbi, large. Yeah, yeah, the rabbi who was larger than life and who um, embodied uh, the truths of Torah in a way that just really boggles the mind is like the personification of all the things that you, that you learn in, in the Bible and the Torah. I understand. And you know what this suggests that going forward, I would like to meet with you again and ask you what those teachings were and to see if we can get a handle on the, you know, the essence of what the Rebbe was, was saying and why he has outlasted his own death this, this yes. way. Yes. Rabbi Itchel Krasnjanski, so nice to talk to Same you. Same here as always. always. Thank you. I, I hope you have a wonderful event. I'll try to be there. Yes, thank you. And everyone, please, who's hearing, please, listening, please come join as well. Yes. Aloha. Yeah. Thank you.